for those of you who are not familiar with IPS, just a few words. Uh, we are the oldest multi-issue progressive think tank in the country and have been very intentionally multi-issue since our founding because we believe that the various injustices in the world that we are trying to confront intersect with each other and we cannot address any one of them in isolation. Um, we work on a bunch of different issues here. Uh, we work on um, economic inequality and poverty. We work on mass incarceration and the prison system. We work on foreign policy and war. We work on um, trade justice and um, we work on drug policy, etc. A whole lot of um, interrelated issues. Uh, my name is Basav Sen, and my work here focuses on climate justice, uh, or specifically the nexus between climate change and environmental destruction and social and economic injustice based on race and economic inequality and other you know, um, similar axes of inequality. And um, my work looks at both building up progressive, just climate policy at the state and local level, because that's the only place we can do it. In the US political context. And not just because of the Trump administration, but for years we've been unable to advance a really far reaching progressive climate agenda at the federal level. And at the same time, not losing sight of the fact that the really egregious policies coming from the federal government need to be critiqued publicly. So we do both. Um, I call it building up the good at the state and local level and tearing down the bad that's coming out of the uh, federal government. And um, with that, let me get into the boring but essential logistics. Um, the event is being videotaped. It's not being live streamed, but um, we will have um, a link to the video up later for people who couldn't come and wish to view it. And um, our restrooms are right out here. Uh, if you go out the door and take a left, they're to the right. Uh, we have two restrooms, both gender neutral. And um, then we have a kitchen back there if you want to get yourself a glass of water or something, which reminds me, do either of you need a glass of water? Go. <laughs> And um, with that, let me introduce our speakers. Um, I'll start with Todd. Um, Todd Miller has researched and written about border issues for more than 15 years, uh, the last eight as an independent journalist and writer. Uh, he lives in Tucson, Arizona, very close to the border, and has also lived in Mexico for several years. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, the NACLA Report on the Americas, Tom Dispatch, The Nation, In These Times, Al Jazeera English, and a number of other outlets. Uh, he has authored two books, uh, Storming the Wall, Climate Change, Migration, and Homeland Security, uh, which appeared last year, and Border Patrol Nation, Dispatches from the Front Lines of Homeland Security uh, from 2014. All right, great to be here. Thanks. Well, good afternoon. It's great to be here. Thanks, thanks for having me. Thanks for the, the nice introduction. Um, it's great to be here in Washington D.C. and then these great off the offices of IPS. Um, and uh, yeah, I just flew in yesterday from Tucson, Arizona. So please excuse the blurry. The, the blurry the blurriness that's coming from my brain into it, probably through my face but I'll try to do my best here and um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I wrote about in my book storming the wall um, and uh, I guess there's many different 
uh, stories that I could bring out of the, that particular book, but I'd, I'd just like to maybe focus on one particular story. And it's a story that um, happened in when I was doing some research on the border of Mexico and Guatemala, actually on the Mexican side, in a town called Tenosique. Um, it's about 20 miles inland from the Guatemala border. And I was there, um, um, and I went to the train yard there, and the train yard is where a lot of people get on the, the famous, infamous, I should say, Bestia, or the Beast, right? The train that people head north um, to other parts of Mexico or to the United States. And I, in there I met these uh, three men from Honduras, young men, um, 18, 19 year old men, uh, farmers, they're all farmers. And uh, they've been there for six days in the train, actually living in the train yard or staying in the train yard. Uh, they, they had intentions of going all the way to the United States. Um, the night before they tried to hop on a train but it was going too fast. And that was one of, that actually is, has been one of the tactics of the, of the Mexican government to, to, to um, try to stop people from crossing or going north through, through the country of Mexico. In fact, Mexico, and I could talk more about this at another time, but Mexico has, quite, has built up its border apparatus quite a bit um, with a lot of assistance and pressure from the United States. Um, so they were there for about six, they were there for about six days, and, it's, and, they, and they mentioned why they were, they were heading north. And they said, when I asked them, I asked them, what, so what's, what's going on in Honduras? And one of the, an 18-year-old, one of the, uh, he told, the 18-year-old um, farmer told me that there was no rain. There was no rain, no uh, harvest, no food, nothing, right? So they're from, so the, they're farmers from a part of Honduras known as a dry corridor. The dry corridor actually extends from Guatemala through Honduras into Nicaragua, El Salvador. Um, dry corridor, so it's known as a little bit more arid, but it's still a lot of farmers live there and depend on the seasonal um, rains uh, for their for their harvests. And that year, it was June of 2015, the rains never came, and it was pr quite devastating. Even <clears throat> the Honduran government even um, tried to start a, a food assistance program for 400 they they uh, 400,000 people who were in distress or on the verge of hunger. Um, uh, one mayor of a, of a nearby community said, this is an unprecedented calamity, what is happening here, almost using like the language of war. And it turns out, you know, this, this, um, uh, this drought was not an anomaly. In talking to climate scientists doing, doing um, modeling in Central America, um, these sorts of dry spells happening um, uh, have been happening more frequently over the years, and it just happened that 2015 was one of those years that it was really bad. And due to the, and looking at the models, the the dry spells and the droughts are predicted to continue to, into the future. And so one one of the climate scientists that I interviewed said that Central America was the quote unquote ground zero for climate change in the Americas. And not only for the, the droughts, the situation of droughts, but also because it's, you know, an isthmus. And I think he meant to include southern Mexico, the isthmus parts of Mexico as well, because there's gigantic bodies of water right on either side. Huge storms can spin off either way. Gigantic super hurricanes, you know, causing mudslides and floods and, and all sorts of chaos. And so um, when I was in the train yard and I, and I was talking to these, um, these farmers, I wondered, you know, how many more of the, you know, well actually in retrospect, how many more of the 400,000 people in Honduras were in a similar situation there? But, it, but it's also important, you know, to think, well, there's many different uh, um, factors converging as to why people leave or are displaced or decide to go from one place to another, um, decide to migrate. And uh, so I often like to look at the Christian Parenti's catastrophic, the framing of catastrophic convergence. And Parenti wrote the book um, Tropic of Chaos, looking at climate change 
in, in it's a 2012 book, but he looks at, you know, according to his framing, there's many different crises going on in the world right now for many different reasons, and political crises, economic crises, and increasingly an ecological strain to that, increase, increasing frequency of ecological crises that are coming in convergence and compounding each other. Perhaps Central America is a very good example you know, even like, even when you look at U.S. policy in Central America, so many different tributaries of U.S. policy could have affected those men being in, in that Tenosique tree, train yard that day, right? Like economic policy that has to do with the International Monetary Fund and World Bank, um, the historic uh, support of military dictatorships, the kind of U.S. militarism in Central America, and now, now the ecological con uh, dynamics that are, that are, that are um, um, now becoming more and more evident, and and it's difficult to take you know climate out you know to separate it and, and to figure out like how many you know when you look at climate displacement, but those numbers are there are organizations attempting to grapple with that and look at numbers of people who are being displaced due to climate change and ecological reasons. Um, for example, the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center is saying that right now. Um, since 2008, uh, um, approximately 21.5 million people are displaced every year due to climate change or climate-related hazards, as they put it. Um, and then the projections as we move to the future are pretty astronomical and depending on what sort of organizations are making the assessments. The Internal Displacement Monitoring Center says that in 2050, between 150 and 350 million people will be displaced due to climate-related reasons. Um, other per, uh, um, prognostications or forecasts are even more dramatic, like I, in, a, in an article in the New York Times just from a few months ago, they, had, they cited 750 million people by 2050. Um, on the move due to climate change. They're looking particularly at Mexico, and they cited a report that, that, that showed one that, that, um, that forecast or made an assessment that maybe one out of 10 Mexicans would be on the move due to climate related reasons, droughts, floods, hurricanes by 2050. Um, talking to um, you know, researchers that are doing empirical sort of research, look, connecting climate with displacement, you know, one of them said, well, you know, it's, it's the, there's a lot of debate as to how many people will be displaced, but what we, what we can say is that it will be quote unquote staggering and without precedent in human history. Um, and so when you look at like the, the displacement the, or the projections for displacement, the displacements that are happening right now, and you just take one thing, like there's, there's no sort of climate status or climate refugee status. Um, and you think of like the, 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 the peoples that are, that are in movement right now, and, and a, lot of, you know, a lot of people internally migrate, but a lot of people, more and more people are crossing borders. And when people cross borders without documents, they're, if, you know, what, what's gonna happen, well most likely they're gonna come face to face with a border enforcement regime of some sort. And this, this is not only the United States, this is worldwide. One of the most stop-telling statistics is in, when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, there were 15 border walls, um, and today there are 70 across the globe. Um, each of those, the, the border enforcement systems have been growing over the last 25 years in dramatic fashion, and you can look at many different places. The United States, excuse me, the United States is one one example, probably the the quote unquote best example of of this border expansion. For in the early 1990s, there were 4,000 U.S. Border Patrol agents. Now there's about 21,000. CBP, Customs and Border Protection, is the largest federal law enforcement agency. It's 65,000 budgets um, for border immigration enforcement in the United States have gone from 1.5 billion dollars to. $20 billion in 2017 if you take the combined um, budgets of Customs and Border Protection and Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Um, and this year it's, good, it's going to be around 24, 23 billion. So it keeps going up and up and up and up and up. Um, there are already 700 miles of border walls, barriers on the U.S.-Mexico border. There's um, 
you know, Predator B, unmanned drones doing overhead surveillance. There's high tech cameras, biometric systems, checkpoints going into 100 mile jurisdictions. Um, the board, I can go on and on about that, but the border has been built up significantly over the last, particularly last 30 years, and all the forecasts show that it's going to be built up more into the future. So this kind of these kind of dynamics of of climate, um, what we're just talking about, displacement and border systems seem to be on a head-on collision. Borders, um, the the buildup of borders, you can see through many different things. One one is just looking at market forecasts. Like there's an increased privatization of different companies moving into the border sector and getting contracts. And, and the, the forecasts for border expansion or the border market keep going up and up and up, doubling like Homeland Security market, doubling from about 300 billion to about 600 billion from the 2010s to the 2020s. So that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it, and then as, I, as I wind down here, is um, to look at different climate assessments that have been made. I want to um, allude to one of them. One of the first Pentagon commissioned climate assessments um, called an abrupt climate change scenario. So it's looking at a worst case scenario. This came out in 2003. And um, it, it says the United States and Australia are likely to build defensive fortresses around their countries because they have the resources and reserves to achieve self-sufficiency. With diverse growing climates, wealth, technology, uh, and abundant resources, the United States could likely survive shortened growing cycles and harsh weather conditions without catastrophic losses. Borders will be strengthened around the country to hold back unwanted starving immigrants from the Caribbean islands, and especially severe pro problem, Mexico and South America. And those are, that's one of the assessments um, coming from the Pentagon. There's been more um, more polished versions, I guess, like unwanted starving immigrants. They don't, probably don't use that exact language, but have the same spirit. Um, and and uh, um, in 2008, uh, an assessment came about as thicker than this book. Um, and it looked at you know all kinds of you know potential future um, scenarios involving like the, the warming of the earth whether it be 1.6, 2.6, 5 degrees. Um, and in those, one of the things that they stressed in, in that, in that, in that um, assessment was that, and I think it was from the National Intelligence Council, and um, one of the things that they stressed was that it takes 30 years for a national security planner to, to plan um, for, to, to bring, I guess, uh, let me paraphrase, to bring the battlefield from the drawing board, no, to bring the plans from the drawing board to the battlefield. And so the idea that, um, you know, that the, you know, right now when you talk, when you think about climate change and, and, and Washington and, tr and, you know, the Trump administration and obviously is a, a renowned climate denier, and, but you have to think, well, the government's many moving parts, and, the, and the, as far as the Department of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security is concerned, those moving parts have been very much um, looking into climate um, issues, and in fact, um, looking 30, 40, 50, 100 years into the future, and it, and have, you know, it makes, like, when, and, and when they're looking at, at what, what they would consider top U.S. threat, threats to national US national security through their eyes in the future they're not there's no way they're going to deny what 97 percent consensus of scientists are saying and so um climate you know to end climate change has has um, um become a, really a top national security um threat it's been declared that by the US government it was declared that in 2010 it's made its way in the quadrennial reviews of the Department of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security in the 2014 DHS quadrennial review which is the public the top public mission statement of <clears throat> DHS and so um, climate change was put alongside a number of other threats so the five point mission of DHS and the five point mission just to remind is um what border security, immigration enforcement, cyber security, um, uh, counterterrorism, and that's the top one actually, and um, critical infrastructure. So climate change has become a one lens among many in which they look um, <clears throat> at that five point mission statement, right? 
And so you can look at the very drought that I was discussing at the very beginning um, of the people in Honduras who are displaced and see that faithfully predicted in the documents of DHS. Um, them knowing that there could be possible mass migrations um, because of changing climates. And they say in these documents that we need to prepare our borders um, possibly for these mass migrations. Without further ado, um, our other speaker today, Brandon Wu, who will bring the conversation about the border home to the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, Brandon Wu is an organizer with Sanctuary DMV, uh, which is a local, you know, D.C., Maryland, Virginia-based immigrants' rights group, and director of policy and campaigns at ActionAid USA. Uh, he helps run Sanctuary DMV's accompaniment program, supporting individuals at their ICE check-ins and immigration court appointments and he leads ActionAid's work on international climate justice, uh, approaching the problem of climate change from the perspective of sustainable development and the rights of impacted people. Yes. yes. Great. Um, thanks, Basav, and thanks, Todd, uh, for that presentation. That was great. Um, so Basav asked me to kind of fill in a little bit from a variety of different angles, so I'll try to do so in a way that's um, coherent and concise. Um, I also have to apologize for any possible blurriness. Um, I, today is my first day back from uh, paternity leave. I've got two weeks old at home, so I'm uh, still pulling it together a little bit. Um, okay, so just a quick introduction. Um, as Basav said, Sanctuary DMV is, is a local um, solidarity group. Um, we um, started kind of as a, a combination of two separate groups that came together uh, in 2016, actually before the election, um, but then really got a jolt of energy, as you can imagine, after um, Trump's election. Um, so we've been organizing kind of in earnest in a lot of different ways since November, December 2016. Um, this is sort of old language that I just pulled from our Facebook page, but. Um, um, I mean, the long and short of it is we're a volunteer group. We're not a 501c3 or a formal nonprofit or anything like that. We're just sort of an organizing collective made up of people like me who are policy walks or organizers in other spaces in our day jobs, as well as folks who are working uh, professionally um, as legal service providers or advocacy organizations or what have you. So it's sort of a mix of folks um, um, working to uh, resist a lot of the policies and practices that we're seeing. Uh, and have been seeing for quite some time. Um, so the first thing that I actually wanted to talk about was um, was to talk about border militarization as a thing that's happening not just at the border, right? Um, so Basav kind of framed it as bringing it home to what's happening here in, in DC. So um, I think as you all know, we're seeing a ton of immigration enforcement that's ramping up across the country not just in that 100 mile zone around the borders where CBP has jurisdiction, um, but literally everywhere. Um, and so just a few examples of this um, uh, kind of in increasing internal enforcement, primarily through ICE, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency. Um, we're seeing a lot of mass raids uh, in parts of the country. So for example, there was a, a raid you probably caught wind of in Tennessee recently, where they raided a meatpacking plant and detained almost 100 people. Um, Elsewhere, people are being picked up kind of in increasingly diverse ways. So people uh, often have to go check in on a regular basis with ICE if they have an ongoing case, um, an ongoing deportation case or something like that. Um, under previous administrations, those have been just sort of routine check-ins, so saying, I'm here, you know, I haven't, I'm, I'm not in hiding, I'm not running away, here's my address, that kind of thing. Um, and they're giving an, another date, say a month or a year later. Um, increasingly, we're seeing people actually just get detained at those check-ins. Um, we've been seeing immigration agents uh, show up at courts where they know people are going to show up for court dates and detain them right there. We've seen them um, show up uh, around schools where they know they're going to drop off their kids and detain them after they drop off their kids. Um, all these kinds of targeted enforcement operations are increasing. Um, last September, there was, a planned, there was a planned ICE operation called Operation Mega. Um, 
we've gotten some internal um, leaks actually saying that originally the parlance for Operation Mega was actually Operation MAGA, Make America Great Again. Uh -huh. Um, and then for, for the public name, they changed it to Mega. Um, that was an operation that was meant to detain up to 10,000 immigrants nationwide, um, and including through intentional maximization of what ICE calls collateral arrests. Mm -hmm. So basically, usually, when they're, when they're going to detain someone, they have someone specific in mind. Um, but often, along the way, they will encounter other undocumented folks. Um, and the policy for Operation Mega was to basically detain everyone they found that was undocumented, right? Um, which is actually like a pretty significant change um, in the way that ICE works. Previously, they have they've done collateral arrests, but they've never made it an intentional policy to maximize them. Um, and this was a particularly cynical timing because it was the end of the fiscal year, and we think that it was time to basically flood detention centers with people so that they could demand more money from Congress for more detention beds. Um, so actually, Operation Mega was a good example of how um, public action can sometimes influence DHS under this administration. Uh, there was a leak about it. Uh, it was leaked to the press. There was a big, there was a bunch of campaigns that went on the week before it was supposed to happen, alerting communities to it, uh, and uh, ICE actually backed off. Um, we, they backed off publicly. We think they actually did run increased enforcement operations in a lot of parts of the country. Um, but publicly, it, it, you know, we actually had some impact, which was interesting to see. Um, other things we're seeing from this administration are obviously ending certain kinds of legal status. So um, DACA is one clear one. Temporary protected status is another. Um, and then one of the more troubling things that we're seeing uh, more recently is specifically targeting activists. Um, so we've seen this administration in recent months specifically single out uh, undocumented folks who are leaders in their community, um, uh, people like Robbie Rockbeer of the New York New Sanctuary Coalition, who runs a very robust immigrant, immigrants' rights solidarity group in New York, uh, Maru Mora of the North, Northwest Detention Center Resistance, who is just an incredible organizer uh, in the Pacific Northwest, including on a, a bunch of other issues like food sovereignty and things like that. Um, in the Northwest, she has actually never been on, uh, she has never officially been in the system. So she crossed the border without documents, was never, was never taken in. Um, ICE has basically no record of her, except she's a visible public figure because of her activism. So she got a notice to appear um, to start deportation proceedings, and she knew the only way that ICE knew about her was because she was a public figure and she was speaking out. Um, <coughs> Locally, we have um, a friend, Alejandra Pablos, who organizes uh, with La Colectiva, which is the Latinx group uh, in Northern Virginia. Um, she was at a non-arrestable action uh, a few months ago, and ICE agents came uh, to the action, singled her out from the crowd, and says, we're, gonna, we're making an example of you, and arrested her. Um, and she was, she was released. There was potentially a mix up between kind of the local authorities and ICE, and she was released. But then she was re-detained shortly after. She's been in detention now for, um, I think, over maybe about a month and a half now. And there's an ongoing effort to, to get her back out. But she was obviously explicitly detained because of her activism. Um, and then uh, this isn't this is probably more CBP than ICE, but there's a group called No More Deaths in uh, in the Southwest that basically supports migrants that are coming across the desert, uh, leaving out food and water and providing some shelter. Um, there have been charges uh, charges against nine No More Deaths volunteers, including one felony charge for harboring uh, against a particular person who was providing shelter. Uh, for folks crossing the border. So just a really clear um, kind of suppression of dissent, suppression of, of speech coming from this administration. Um, I will say that it's really important to note that this isn't just uh, a Trump administration thing, right? I think probably all of us in this room are aware that um, the machinery of mass detention, mass deportation existed well before Trump. Um, Obama, of course, deported almost three million people. Um, so there's there's been this kind of ramping up of rhetoric and this sort of refusal to adhere to certain kinds of norms that we didn't see before. Um, but all the infrastructure has been in place, and the Democratic Party has been you know incredibly complicit in allowing this massive increase in funding for uh, both ICE and CDP. So this is not just a you know we're 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 fighting Trump problem. Um, 
one thing that I, 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 I was asked to really speak about is, um, particularly when it comes to uh, the work that we're doing to defend folks who are losing legal status, like DACA recipients, um, there's a really fine line that I think we all have to tread about not falling into a kind of good immigrant versus bad immigrant trap. Um, so I think I have a slide, yeah. Um, so this administration in particular is really ramping up rhetoric on immigrants as criminals. Um, and we see that as really a strategy to suppress dissent. Um, the idea being that it's really hardwired in us in this country um, to care less about someone if, we, if they have been labeled a criminal, right? Um, we just, it's kind of, once that label is put on someone, we are just less likely to stand up for that person and, and their rights. Um, and so, if the new people are defined as criminal, we're naturally gonna care less about them, right? And so we believe that the Trump administration is, is really just attempting to define the entire undocumented immigrant population as criminal so that when mass deportations really ramp up, there's going to be less of an outcry about it. Um, so that's something that we, we are really careful to include in all of our trainings, all of our public uh, events at Sanctuary DMV about pushing back against the criminalization uh, aspect. And, and we, just to give you a flavor of how we do that, we talk about kind of a, a typology of, of four different kinds of criminalization of how this happens. So one, uh, as you can see up here, is stereotyping an entire community as criminal. So and that goes back to Trump's comments uh, during the campaign as Mexicans as rapists or the sort of ongoing narrative of Central American, all Central American migrants as gang members, right, MS-13 members, um, making activity that wasn't previously a crime into one or interpreting the law in a more expansive way that will ensnare more people, um, writing or enforcing the law in an unfair or biased way, so racial profiling is kind of a classic example of this. Um, and then making someone's criminal history the only relevant thing about them as a human being. So that, I think, is one of the most profound things that, um, that, that happens. So, I mean, Obama did this, right, talking about um, felons, not families, right? We're deporting felons, not families. Um, and, you know, we want to argue that when we say immigrant rights or human rights, that has, a, that, that has meaning, right? Like, we're in solidarity with all immigrants, no matter what. Um, if, you know, no matter, I think this was said at the launch of our Congregations Network event, you know, it's no matter where you come from, uh, no matter why you're here, no matter whether or not in your life you've committed a crime, you are a human being and you deserve to be treated with dignity. Um, so we take that really seriously, both for, I think, principal reasons, but as well as strategic reasons. Um, because if we're, if we're only defending kind of the, the most sympathetic cases, we're going to be defending an increasingly shrinking set of the population as the criminalization narrative expands. Um, so just really quickly, I, I'm going to talk about what Sanctuary DMV is actually doing. Um, so we've got four working groups right now, um, political action, rapid response, accompaniment, and congregations. Um, so just, just super quickly, political action kind of organizes responses to um, immigration enforcement activity in DC that we think um, you know, needs to be highlighted and, and can't go quietly. Um, we're also increasingly partnering with other folks. Um, so for example, the, um, the Metro DC DSA chapter is organizing these great uh, monthly events that are uh, exposing people that are profiting from the detention and deportation system. Um, so Todd mentioned that the, you know, there's a real industry here. Uh, and a lot of those folks live in DC. So they're executives with the private prison companies or they're, they're in-house lobbyists for those companies. So we're taking part in some actions to just expose those people, go to their homes, um, and basically make a lot of noise, uh, make sure that they're not invisible. Um, we also, so this is an event we organized with Mara Mora after she got her, um, um, her notice to appear. So we, we're doing just sort of political rallies as, um, as needed, basically. Um, we have a rapid response team. This is just a, a photo from our first training that we have several hundred volunteers who are trained to basically show up when there is immigration enforcement activity happening and film it um, and, and try, to, try to basically um, make what ICE is doing as public as possible. We have um, an accompaniment group, again, just another photo of a training that um, accompanies folks to their ICE check-ins or to immigration court appointments or any other contact with the system where there might be a fear of uh, detention or deportation. 
Um, and then we have a congregations organizing effort. So uh, about a year ago, we launched the DMV Sanctuary Congregations Network, which is actually separate from Sanctuary DMV. They have a full-time staff person um, and everything. Um, but that's a network that launched with 60 different congregations in the area from 19 different faith traditions of so just congregations that are working in a variety of different ways to um, to provide sanctuary and be in solidarity. Um, okay, so I want to pivot um, quickly. I have, I think, a few minutes left. Um, my other hat, uh, as Basav mentioned, is with Action Aid. So I run the climate justice work there, really focused on. Um, really focus on climate justice in the context of kind of global north global south relations, um, in the context of, of neocolonialism, in the context of that particular power dynamic <coughs> that exists at the UN uh, climate negotiations especially. Um, but just to link, you know, as, as closely as possible to, to what we've been talking about, this is a chart that one of my colleagues kind of sketched out um, after Brexit, which I think, I at least find super helpful um, about the links between between these things. So you can kind of start anywhere on the circle. Let's say we start at no climate action, which is basically status quo, right? What's happening now? Um, that obviously leads to escalating climate change, uh, which is going to increase, uh, going to lead to a massive increase in climate-induced migration, as Todd sketched out. Um, and then one of the responses to that has been an increase in anti-immigrant rhetoric. So here in Europe and Australia, in you know, in a number of places, we're not alone in this. Um, and that sort of emboldened the far right, um, which obviously looks different in different contexts, um, but is often linked to climate denial or further climate inaction, right? So it's just sort of this vicious cycle. And then of course at the center of it um, is the science of climate change itself, where um, even if the Paris Agreement on climate change is fully implemented, that's gonna lead us to something like a 3.5 degree increase from global uh, from pre-industrial global temperatures, which is just, I mean, we don't even know how catastrophic that's going to be, right? Um, so there's sort of this vicious cycle that's that's going on. Um, and the particular problem with this is that climate change is a sort of uniquely global problem, right? It's, it's we're in a situation where achieving real climate justice is going to require an unprecedented level of global solidarity and global cooperation. Um, so obviously emissions are borderless in their impact um, on global temperatures, um, and impacts are felt really disproportionately um, by the poorest and most vulnerable in the world. So a climate solution that comes absent the context of global solidarity um, is simply going to mean that the wealthy, particularly in the global north, um, are going to survive, and the poorest, particularly in the global south, are going to perish. Um, so a lot of us talk about for example, the UN climate negotiations as a process where countries are negotiating who lives and who dies. Um, and so at the nation state level, so obviously this gets a lot more complicated at, and there are different levels, but at the nation state level, the kind of global cooperation we need, we can, we can look at on one level quantitatively. So what does, for example, Okay, what does, for example, the U.S. need to do uh, to kind of be doing our fair share to uh, and put in this uh, put in our fair share towards this global effort? So we know we need to reduce our emissions massively. We know we need to provide a huge amount of finance and technological transfer to poorer countries um, so that they can increase their climate action as well as adapt to impacts. Right? Um, uh, a group of organizations, I think IPS was part of this. Um, did an analysis a couple of years ago of countries' kind of historical responsibility. Um, so our, our each country's emissions as well as each country's kind of national wealth, essentially. So what should our, and we calculated based on that what our fair share of action should be. And we found that even under Obama, the pledges we were, we were making were less than one-fifth, probably closer to one-sixth of what we should be doing. And basically all developed countries were more or less at that point. Um, there, way underachieving what they should be pledging. Um, most of the um, countries in the global south were doing actually a lot better, particularly countries that get scapegoated a lot in our discourse. So China and India were actually pledging to do roughly their fair share, if not a bit more. Um, and so this has been actually been sort of a really valuable exercise in saying, hey, like we, are, we know we're not doing our fair share in the US, obviously, especially now. 
but the magnitude of it, I think, is really useful when you, when you look at it. Here's another just chart. Again, this is, this is very bad PowerPoint etiquette. This is a page from a report, but you can see this is the US obligation, that, that, that bar. The green is kind of where we should be. These lines right here are the pledges we made under Obama for climate action. Mm -hmm. So we need to be way, way, way up there. Um, and unfortunately, we are in a political environment now where there's this rise in kind of reactionary nationalism, not just in the US, but <laughs> elsewhere, that makes it politically impossible to get up there, right? Um, and you know, we know that militarizing borders and suppressing dissent is kind of the thing that governments are trying to do, and we know that that's a dead end. Um, and so, you know, in order to get up there, in order to, to achieve kind of real climate justice, um, there's a case to be made that in many ways that's going to require actually a dismantling of borders um, and an embrace of a much more radical global solidarity than, than we've yet seen. Sorry, but a little over time. No, but that's, that's great. I mean, it was all very informative. And uh, um, huge thank you to both our presenters. Um, and just to ensure that we have enough time for all of your questions, I'm going to kick it off with just a couple of questions for um, each of the panelists to get the discussion going and then open it up to everyone. And um, I'm sorry, I had some prepared questions that I'd shared with both of you, but if you don't mind, I will deviate a little bit <laughs> because other questions occurred to me just listening. Um, so Todd, you spoke about the web of corporations who are benefiting from this regime of border control, or more broadly, the regime of you know uh, prisons and incarceration and law enforcement, detention, and deportation, all of that. Um, can you expand what you see as this? web of corporations to include more corporations outside of that outside of that system border so to speak and and the one obvious one that occurred to me is Wells Fargo who are a financer of the private prison system and also a financer of uh, fossil fuel extraction uh, so so you know could you comment on kind of a broader swath of corporate America and their political interest in our system of uh, immigration enforcement. <clears throat> yeah, um, I don't know if I have any, that's the Wells Fargo example is a very you know, good one with those dual interests, of course. Um, uh, I mean, like looking at some of like G4S, or if people are familiar with the company G4S. Um, G4S has, uh, I think they're out of the UK, but they're a transnational company. They have, you know, security operations throughout the globe. Um, and they have a contract with Customs and Border Protection right now. So, so if, if Border Patrol makes arrests of people in the Arizona desert, for example, a G4S van, which is basically a cell on wheels, um, you know, people are detained and they put in this in this van and then transported to short-term detention in U.S. border patrol <coughs> stations. Um, G4S uh, simultaneously has has looked into the future um, and looked into, uh, and not necessarily that they're investing in like the fossil fuel economy, so to speak, but they are looking at projections, the very same projections that I was mentioning before of, from the United Nations saying that 250 million people would be displaced by 2050. And they, they explicitly say that their capacity as a, as a, as a company that's developed with, in border systems, doing security work like that, quote unquote security work, um, that they'll be, you know, that their services will be more needed in the future due to these kind of climatic impacts that, that we see before us. And, and uh, you know, or, or another example, Lockheed Martin's uh, another example. Lockheed Martin is, has been recognized as um, one of the, I don't know how to put it, one of the most green, the greener, or they, they've been going, they've been doing a lot of investing in, in kind of, um, what is it, uh, 
investing in, uh, they're making sure that, you know, that a kind of carbon footprint mm -hmm. is lessening the carbon footprint, so to, so to speak, and investing in, in projects throughout the world that um, are doing are, are doing more sustainable practices. You know, there's a fishery in Hawaii that they 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 use as an example, and at the same time, Lockheed Martin, um, it, you know, obviously sells sells its 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 uh, weapons and and um, technologies to the U.S. military. Um, and which is the number one carbon, has the number one carbon footprint in the world, right, the U.S. military. And also, they're one of the top corporations that do border, get border contracts. So you have this, like, array of, of, I don't know how to put it, like, different contradictions, but just not, even, but, but when you put it into that framework of climate change, it's, they're just banking in on any possible way you can, can make a profit, right? And I think you could, you could go, go you know and, and look at different companies and find similar things like the Wells Fargo example Lockheed Martin example the G4S example um, I'm certain that 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 uh, when you look at the top military contractors that are getting big also big border contracts and that and that would include Elbit Systems from the Israeli company Elbit Systems who has got the top border contract in the last couple of years um, that they're they're making those sorts of into the future assessments, like I mentioned before, and and there's no way they're not looking at, you know, the kind of what's what the globe will look like in 50 years. And when you look at the globe in 50 years, there's no way you can look at the potential impacts of climate change. Thank you, Doug. And um, here's an issue that both of you brought up in your presentations. Um, taught probably a little more explicitly, but you did bring it up implicitly as well. Um, some environmentalists, who shall remain unnamed, um, applaud the US military for uh, saying in the time of Trump that yes, climate change is a huge threat to national security, and some people point to that and say that, see, uh, the military is progressive on climate change issues. They recognize that it's happening. Why, you know, why is the um, Trump administration so backwards on this issue? Um, what would you say to them in a few words? <laughs> I only get a few words. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> you, you get several words. <laughs> well, I thought it was very interesting that, that quote that taught that I had not heard that before. Um, and I think it's useful to sort of air that for people to say this is, this is really the motivation, right, behind these assessments. Um, it is not progressive, it is not altruistic in any way, right? Um, but more broadly, I, I think um, this is a phenomenon that we're really struggling with under this, this uh, administration, which is that Basically, the baseline for being good on climate has been shifted such that if you think it's real and if you think we should be doing something on it, you're, you're good, right? Or like, that's the approach of a lot of climate activists and environmental groups at this point. So, I mean, the, the, the clearest example of this was at the last climate negotiations, there was a big show there where the US, um, like a variety of US um, sub-federal officials and corporations open this huge U.S. pavilion in the climate negotiations, which has never been done before, and said, we're still in, right? Even though the Trump administration has said they're withdrawing from the Paris Agreement, this country is still committed to it. And there's part of that that is kind of helpful, but there is a celebratory atmosphere to it that I thought was really, um, well, disappointing and also kind of nauseating, right, where these these people had suddenly become climate champions because they believe climate is real, right? And there was no critical analysis. So okay, what are the solutions that you're proposing? Are they actually, like, who are they going to benefit, right? Um, and I think that same kind of critical lens um, hasn't really been applied to the US military because those the comments that are coming from the Department of Defense and so on are being used for purely instrumental purposes in very, in very specific contexts like Congress. <coughs> Um, influence a particular kind of member of Congress, and that's the sort of thing that they'll, they'll listen to. Um, and I think that exposing the sorts of things like, like the quote that Todd had would be really useful and, and much needed. 
Uh, thanks a lot, Brandon. And before we get into the Q&A, just one quick request of you. Um, if you can tell people, um, you know, most of, you know, most everyone here is from, you know, is local from the DC area. Uh, so if you could tell people ways to plug into and support the work of Sanctuary mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, so the best thing to do is probably um, look at our Facebook page. Um, if you just search for Sanctuary DMV on Facebook, that is the thing that we have online. That's our online presence that's most regularly updated. Um, there's a sign up mm -hmm. form on there for our email list. Um, you can also message to us directly there. There are folks that check that. The other thing is we're making a big push right now to publicize a hotline that uh, undocumented folks can call if they see uh, immigration enforcement activity, so to activate our rapid response network, or if they want to request accompaniment to an ICE check-in or a court uh, appointment or, or any other contact with the system. So we have these cards that have the hotline number, and there's like a very short kind of know your rights thing on it as well. It's in English on one side, Spanish on the other. Unfortunately, we don't have other languages yet. Um, but it, you know, it, if you are in contact with folks, um, impacted folks in your personal life or professional life or through a congregation or whatnot, um, these we're making a really strong effort to get the, the hotline number out there. Um, so you know, I can pass those out at the at the end. But um, Facebook is probably our most reliable online presence. Okay, thank you, and another big thank you to both our speakers. Questions. I have um, no need of everybody, so I just want to ask. I have two questions for each one. Uh, one question for each one of you. So my name is Kelly Oleran. Uh, I'm an uh, environmental justice advocate here in the district. I've been living uh, in the DMV area for over 30 years. I'm also an immigrant. So when you this particular topic directly impacts me, uh, right? Uh, if I go to any of the marches and I get uh, stopped by anyone. Even my naturalized citizenship could be at risk. Um, I'm also from Bolivia, so uh, it's one of the poorest countries, how you guys call it, the global south. So we're vastly impacted by um, climate change. My question to Todd specifically is, um, there is an assumption in what you're claiming that once climate refugees cross the border, um, they reach land where the sole threat is immigration and persecution um, based on the Trump issues right now. But why don't you include a major impact, which is internal to the U.S., uh, which is um, gentrification and displacement, and, or displacement as a result of gentrification. And much of that is due to the green gentrification that we're seeing, uh, where impacted climate justice communities here in U.S. soil are facing climate change threats equally. And the resiliency tools that are used to protect communities like mine and people like me um, are actually uh, more impactful. Uh, here, so we're also we become climate refugees even in U.S. soil, and I will say that you know those tools are smart growth uh, tools that are um, like constantly impacting us. Yet um, liberal environmentalists just put that on the side, and I'm saying liberal as a ultra liberal person, right? I'm a naturalized citizen, and I've always voted Democrat. Um, I'm very progressive, uh, but I'm also very critical of of that of that side, right? This is a very one-sided topic, like us against them. But us is not also safe area. So that was that's my question to you. Um, the question to Brandon is: You mentioned that your organization is a nonprofit. Thus, it does not follow the regulatory forces that protect communities, the communities that you aim to serve. Um, that's very troubling in my in my view because it seems that your organization ha feels that it has the right to advocate on behalf of the most impacted communities without even acknowledging that a one-sided lens can be very detrimental, that one-sided lens that I've talked about, right? Um, it specifically farther polarizes, polarizes us within our immigrant communities. Um, and um, it imposes an intervention from your end on our communities, polarizing us. And a lot of the, the, the people who are advocating, while I, I really support them, right? I think that they're doing it well-intentioned. They're also gentrifiers. So they're equally impacting us here. So um, why is it that you chose to do follow this nonprofit world, which that would make you your organization actually um, more? You would have to follow regulatory 
modes, not just do voluntary work as you please. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you, you raise really excellent points. Um, um, I did, like, in, in my book, I didn't go in, I didn't look into gentrification, um, like you're, <clears throat> in the way that you're discussing, but I, I think that you, you hit really, really, you know, you're hitting the nail on the head, especially as far as, like, when you look at displacement um, and what's going on with gentrification throughout the country, throughout this country, internally to the United States. I do look at, um, you know, in, the, in, in this book, I do look at, um, you know, the, the kind of, you know, obviously the impacts of, of climate, when you look at climate change, you know, in, in ways, um, they're, they're obviously going to hit the United States as well as, you know, it's hitting, they're going to hit everywhere, right? And, and, um, and, the, and the idea of, like, people being displaced within the United States as, again, within this kind of convergence of factors, and I think gentrification definitely fits into, it's really hard to discuss climate change because you have to, like, you, like, extract a certain part of what is, what is all part of this gigantic system oppressive system, that a displacing system, a system that doesn't value human life like you're talking about, and you just like kind of like extract it, and I think it has to be in this, you had, the analysis has to be in this ent entire um, phenomenon like you, you bring up, um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, you, so, yeah, I look at, you know, the different, you know, what I'm looking at primarily is the massive expansion of the U.S. border immigration apparatus, and, and I do refer to like some of the things that Brandon, like the idea that this thing keeps growing and growing, and this idea of displacement, looking, focusing primarily on China, climate change is growing and growing, and they're coming, you know, it's coming to a, to a head. Um, and there, and, but, but there's got to be new, new ways to think about it, and I think one of the, one of the ways I think you, you allude to quite well, we have to think about the internal processes in, in the country and, and how, you know, that's affecting, as well as, you know, the, the international kind of global, north, global, south relationship, so. Um, thanks. I, I really appreciate um, the points that you're raising, so just to respond, um, sorry, I'm trying to get back to the beginning here. Um, it, it's useful to give just a quick history of, of Sanctuary DMV. So I mentioned that we came, we originally came out of two separate groups. So one was called Sanctuary DMV. It was a project of the New Sanctuary Movement, which is primarily run by Church World Service, or was at the time. Um, and then a group called La Comite, um, which was a local, primarily undocumented group. Um, Okay, yeah. Yeah, that was part of it. Okay, great. So you, you're familiar with a lot of that history. So I think we, Sanctuary DMV evolved into what it is now, which is much more of an ally group um, uh, for, a number of, for a number of reasons. And I would say that we are very aware of that dynamic. Um, at the beginning of 2017, there were a lot of folks in the group who were very interested in having a policy working group to do advocacy with city council, um, to put pressure on Mayor Bowser to strengthen DC sanctuary policies. We decided that we needed to disband that group because we did not have the legitimacy to advocate for the communities because we did not have close enough ties to the community as a primarily ally group. Um, we uh, partnered with groups like Men Just One Voice, like Trabajadores Unidos, who have more direct relationships. Um, but they didn't, there wasn't really the capacity to put together a comprehensive kind of advocacy plan for, for DC. Um, so we deliberately disengaged from doing policy advocacy because, specifically because of that representational and kind of identity issue, right? So what we decided that we could do um, was, I mean, what I see more as almost service, direct service work, right? So uh, the rapid response network we did in, um, there was a lot of consultation with both local and national groups about is this needed, is this a useful role for us? Um, and the, you know, it, the answer was yes, so we did it. Same thing with accompaniment. We asked, we did a lot of consultations um, with those kinds of organizations saying, you know, is this a need? Is this something that, um, that we could fill as, as a primarily ally group to, to leverage sort of more privileged volunteers? 
Right. Um, again, the answer was yes. And so we limited ourselves to those kinds of things. The political action group is a little bit different and newer, right? And so that gets a little bit closer to advocacy and representation. Um, but we're working, we're doing actions. Um, well, actually, I guess the DSA actions are um, a slightly different thing targeting profiteers because that's mainly with DSA, which is primarily a white group. Um, but all of our other actions have been have been um, in partnership, and we've kind of been secondary to a lead group. Um, most often, it's been La Colectiva in Virginia. Um, and so we have, I, I think, tried to be very conscious of the fact that Sanctuary DMV is not entirely, but primarily an ally space at this point, uh, and to be as accountable as possible to the communities. Um, you know, granted, we're, like I said, we're not a formal nonprofit, so there is no formal accountability mechanism. I would argue you could say the same thing about formal nonprofits, is that they're not actually formally accountable to who they're supposed to be speaking for anyway. So I'm not sure how that distinction um, would make too much of a difference. Um, but just to say, I mean, we're super aware of those dynamics and, and are trying to navigate them the best we can and, and, yeah, and build stronger relationships with the impacted folk community. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I um, was interested in the, the quote from the report that you were citing, um, particularly because, because as, as you were saying, Jason, it kind of reveals some of the, the uh, underlying or the underbelly uh, uh, motivation for some of the uh, seriousness with which the military seems to be taking climate change now. Um, bearing that in mind, does it make sense for cities, counties at the local level to be looking at what, say, military bases are doing to modernize their infrastructure to deal with, with oncoming climate change as a potential uh, you know, way to think about how to mitigate impacts? Or does, or does it feel like you know, their motivations are too suspect you know, for, for, how, for why they're shoring up their bases, and so we should be thinking about alternatives instead? Is that, is that a question that's, that's sensible or parsable? That's an answer, yeah. It's, um, well, I mean, I think there's, when you look at the military, there's a couple things that they're doing. I mean, there's, they're definitely, like their naval bases, there were, you know, like the one in, uh, where is it, um, in Virginia? Norfolk, right? Nor Norfolk. Yeah. yeah, the naval base there, it's like getting flooded constantly now. Um, and so that's one of the prime examples, like in the, well, I think you referenced, you know, I think there's this, there's this movie out now called Age of Consequences. I don't know if anyone's seen that movie, but it's, um, it's uh, I think they reference that base quite a bit and, and uh, they're doing all kinds of readjustments and, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, so many, you know, the military is very, I mean, their own bases are getting flooded. So, you know, that's, oh well, yeah, here's the military talking about climate change, they know it's real. You know, and I'm sure, like when you look at local governments, they're probably looking at, depending on the local government, it really depends. They're looking, probably looking at, you know, certain climate resilience sort of activities based on what the military is doing. But at, at the end of the day, when the military is, you know, fortifying its bases, it's fortifying its mission, right? And that's, you know, what's its mission? Like when every time a, a base gets realigned and refortified. And, and then you think about how what that means as we progress in the 21st century and into the future and 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 the kind of emphasis that the military keeps putting on climate change and, and, I, and I would stress like you know the borders and the immigration stuff as well um, that kind of fortification of the status quo right of, of this world of divisions and and who's who wins and who loses right and that that sort of Every time the military, you know, the whole military apparatus is fortified in that way, that's the kind of worldview fortification that's that's also happening simultaneously. Yeah, I, I had sort of a two-part question. One of which sort of follows on this point about the militarization and how the military is dealing with climate change. One of the creepy things about it, I can't think of a more scientific word. Um, is that on in terms of certain aspects, not the fortification side, but the uh, the alternative energy side, for instance, like the Navy, two years ago said by I think two years from now something like that, 
they're going to have 75%, some, I, I'm forgetting the numbers, but some huge percentage of all fuels uh, be non-fossil fuels. Uh, and given how much they use in terms of fossil fuels for massive fleets of trucks and submarines and all of this stuff, it's kind of, one, probably not true. But if it were true, the impact on the cost, you know, when you're talking about the economy of scale of such an enormous institution, the impact on what it would, you know, the reason that we don't rely more on wind and solar and whatever is the cost differential because of subsidies and whatever. If that changed because the military wanted to do it, it would have, I assume, a pretty big economic impact more broadly. So one, ask, one part of my question is about that. How do we answer that? How do we talk about that? You know, and say that's a bad thing because they're doing it for all the wrong reasons, recognizing that the impact is going to be more broad than that. The other side of the of the militarization question has to do with the international collaboration that's underway. So when you're talking particularly about like G4S or Elbit, the Israeli company, these are companies that are right at the center, for example, of the oppression of Palestinians. They're collaborating on building walls together on the US-Mexico border and on the, the wall that surrounds Gaza, for instance. It's the same technology, the same electrifica electrification of the wall, all of that. I'm curious if either of you could speak to the international collaboration of the resistance movements that are moving, because there's lots of resistance movements in on the Indian border with Bangladesh and whatever, but we're not seeing a huge amount of global collaboration um, that is sufficient somehow. So if you could talk about that a little bit, one or both of you. Sure, I don't unfortunately have um, a good answer uh, or much knowledge. Um, the one thing I would say is that I would imagine that the US Navy, a lot of the non fossil fuel energy is nuclear. Right? I mean, some, but yeah, they've said a lot of it won't be, but who knows? It's probably. Okay. Probably. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I, this is not a question that I've thought about a lot, so mm -hmm. I, I'll hand it over to Todd and then maybe come back if there's anything I. Uh, yeah, the, it was interesting if, you know, I know that, you know, the military is definitely, they have all different programs to reduce their carbon, carbon footprint, like net zero, I think is what the Army calls its program. Um, uh, the, then the, the General Mattis, the, the Secretary of Defense, he famously said in 2003 when he was commanding troops in Iraq that, you know, what was it, I'm going to have to paraphrase, but cut look cut us from the tether of fossil fuels. So, so the idea that, so was he saying that because he was interested in actual redu reduction of the carbon footprint, or was he saying that because, you know, as another person I've talked to said the same thing, that they want to make the military apparatus more quote unquote lethal. Lethal in the sense that, you know, it takes a lot of time to like fill up your, you know your tanks with um, with fossil fuels and gases you know and 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 so you kill, you kind of like do two things at once you you like reduce your carbon footprint but you also make a military that's already the you know overwhelmingly powerful in the world and world affairs and then make it more quote unquote lethal as 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 um as a goal right um I don't know that's one that's one of the main things that came to mind when you when you um, when you um, mentioned that and then the, how do you talk about that I think you just have to you, I mean you really have to I think that definitely has to be a part of the conversation like I travel through where I live in Arizona and you see like the Elbit systems and the Israeli company um, surveillance towers and they're, they're um, constructing you know what are called integrated fixed towers throughout southern Arizona right now 52 of them 14 of them on a Native American reservation, the Tana Atum reservation, um, and and um, you see you see these, and they're they're like being powered by solar panels, you know, or the newest Border Patrol station is a station that has like when it was constructed in 2012, it was the most energy efficient Border Patrol station, you know, and so you have this kind of, you know, they have using recycled waters, they have even like ludicrously a bicycle um, 
like a bicy like a whole bicy bicycle parking zone. And it's this station that's in Ajo, Arizona. It's so far away. Like most of the agents live in Phoenix. And then Phoenix is like an hour and a half away, so nobody comes on a bicycle. Nobody goes to work on a bicycle, but they still it's flaunted in their public relations. You know, we have a bicycle, we have this, we have that, and and it's sort of like you know, there's this like PR routine. There is probably an honest to God attempt to reduce, and there's a, a military mission behind it. So I think that needs just to be initial conversation, and and um, and um, you know. I mean, obviously, things should be switched to solar power and energy as much as we possibly can. But, but should that energy be concentrated in fortifying an apparatus? <clears throat> and then to the collective resistance part of it, um, uh, I mean, there's, you know, I, the Bangladesh-Indian border is such a. I mean, that's that's one of those those hot spots that you know. I think India just finished constructing a wall. And it's fortified by a massive border patrol, and Bangladesh is expecting to have 20 million people displaced. Um, yeah, and so you have this like this whole situation being set up, which is maybe one of the sharpest examples, but it's it's a global example of what's going on. You know, this idea that people, you know, if you just take those two things, climate change and border building. And put them together. There's that's that's the prime example that's happening across the world, and there's so many like there is so many large scale and small scale and individual like you know resistance. You know there's from like when I was doing this book and I and I in my book I went to the Philippines, Central America, and U.S. Mexico borderlands, but also Paris for the U, the, the the climate summit in 2015. And just from just like off the top of my head, I just met so many different. <coughs> people from so many different parts of the world, doing so many different things, individually, collectively. And I, I almost think that there's such a, there needs to be a catalog of, of, of the kind of resistance that's actually happening, because it, because collectively, if, 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 if we could see it before our eyes, it, I think it would be um, quite, quite, you know, it would tell, another t tale would be starting to be told or like a tale that sometimes is sold in a local way it can be told in a more global way um, because it's certainly out there and and I think collectively it's very massive but um, um, okay. just it, it's it's a challenge right I mean we're not even coordinated uh, in the US right there are sort of versions of like local solidarity groups in any number of cities that are barely talking to each other, right, uh, and are doing very similar things, but are there's you know there's not really any umbrella coordination, um, uh, any that's that's more than ad hoc, right? So there's there's a lot of work to do. Before I get to your question and yours, Manuel, um, just one quick comment I want to make that responds to the first of Phyllis's questions. Um, if you look at the latest public um, U.S. national security strategy, which I think is 2016, I think it still dates back to the Obama years. Um, it's actually a chilling document. If you look at what they say about the world energy system, here you have the U.S. military for various reasons, some of which have to do with saving money, Others may have to do with recognizing that there will be a future scarcity of fossil fuels. Uh, others may have to do with PR, as you were pointing out. Um, they're trying to reduce their reliance on fossil fuels. But at the same time, talking about the world energy system, they say quite openly that fossil fuel usage will continue to grow that the U.S. is rapidly moving from becoming a net importer to a net exporter of oil and gas. Uh, we are already the world's largest producer of oil and gas, and uh, if you look at present-day trends, we'll become a net exporter sometime in the early 2020s. Okay? And so they're looking at a future where they want to make the world safe for U.S. fossil fuel exports um, and for um, exploration and production of fossil <coughs> fuels overseas by U.S. companies. 
so so there is kind of this contradiction here where on one hand they're reducing their own fossil fuel usage while acting as the enforcement arm of the US based fossil fuel industry. Uh, so um, that is a part of what you could say to push back on the notion that uh, the um, military's approach to climate change is somehow progressive. Um, so just one quick comment. And um, meaningful, effective, or promising effort um, between different um, nonprofits, a coalition um, that works both on the scientific aspects of climate change and um, environmental aspects, social justice, immigration, um, I feel like that's what I'm missing. Are you aware of any any coalitions? Yes. Um, <laughs> so I mean, Basavi can speak to this no. as well. But um, in the U.S., uh, there's the Climate Justice Alliance, um, which is um, uh, a group of, of primarily grassroots, kind of place-based um, uh, organizations that are fighting local struggles that combine both climate change and sort of social a variety of social justice issues. Um, so Climate Justice Alliance is probably the, the, the main um, place to look in the US. There's also, I mean, there's a US Climate Action Network, which is more kind of traditional NGOs, but there's a sort of concerted effort, a kind of insurgent effort within that network to include more um, grassroots and frontline community groups. Um, so that's sort of an interesting contested space right now. Um, internationally, there is, um, well, there are a variety of formations um, of different kind of international um, NGOs and or grassroots groups. Um, um, there, there is a Climate Action Network International, but that's kind of very much dominated by traditional environmental NGOs. And again, there's an insurgent movement there that I've been a part of trying to push that and challenge that grouping a little bit, but it's a contested space. Um, there are, I would say globally there's more kind of regional initiatives um, than there is a coherent global climate justice movement. Um, particularly in, in um, Asia, there's actually a quite strong kind of uh, Asian regional climate justice movement that's quite well coordinated. Um, but yeah, I mean those, th those things exist. As you can imagine, they're, they're kind of messy and complicated and ever changing. But, um, there is there is definitely kind of a wing of folks focused on climate that are equally focused on social justice issues and see them as one, right? And aren't just working on climate just are on climate as an environmental issue. I want to pass. He was a little bit asking about. Sorry. I, I want to pass. He was a little bit asking about networking and. Oh. And what? Yeah. I would add to the discussion about the. Um, various coalitions uh, and, and, and the lack of collaboration. Um, there's a political aspect to it, right? So like I mentioned, I'm from Bolivia. And right now, there's a big movement um, in terms of within this hemisphere almost to really bring down these populist movements that are coming out of Latin America, correct? Um, in my country, is one of them, for example, right? Um, but there is this idea that they're not necessarily doing climate justice work. That, that the work that my particular president has done in terms of addressing climate issues, water issues, water wars started in my country and he was able to become a president because of it, right? And what that has um, uh, pri uh, taken away the privatization and literally even taking USAID, kicking USAID out of my own country has made a big impact on us being able to um, get aid from other uh, nations such as China, right? And now you're collaborating with with other not necessarily US centric places. And that's actually benefited us. So when we talk about really collaborative efforts in, in, in these coalitions, really understand that even those countries that are now at, at risk in, um, because of the term of populism, are, they may actually be you know, collaborating with them and really changing this mindset of, oh, populist and socialism, uh, it, in, in that dictatorship mode is negative for us here in the United States because we're all about democracy. 
Um, so it's interesting because I think there's a lot of benefits that are uh, in, in Bolivia, lithium plants are, are, um, are coming up and he was able to, to build them up. In my own city, uh, we have different trans uh, transit modes, right, that are not necessarily smart worthy, right? Um, they're not necessarily BRTs, they're not necessarily bikes because you can't bike in like 13,000 feet of sea level <laughs> mountains, but they're really innovative. Um, and all of that became, came as a result of uh, our, our political leadership but then they're vilified. So I think that th there's a political component to this as well. Um, I'm, I'm, I've, I read Todd's book, I highly recommend it. Um, but I was, he, you know, you're somebody who actually goes to like those conventions of all the technology firms and, and uh, <clears throat> I've heard you talk a little bit about okay, there's this whole push to build a wall, but we actually have all these powerful technological walls. And I'm just curious, like, give us a window into some of what you see both on the ground and emerging in terms of these private companies and the technologies they're using and how they're sort of building interception walls aside from the actual border front. Yeah. Yeah, I would argue that it's like there's a corporate nexus that, that has been long through a number of different administrations on um, building up this border apparatus that we have now. Um, if you look at the 2000, just look at the 2012 strategy, they, they stress that it's a multi-layered strategy. And so the border is not just the borderline, it's layered into the country, and I would argue layered to encompass the entire country. Mm -hmm. But um, they, if you think of the US southern border, they're, they're thinking specifically of the 100 mile zone um, in that 100 mile zone, there's actual international boundary line where there are walls already built. They're, they're placed intentionally in traditional places where people would cross so that people would circumvent them and go into to areas that are too dangerous and desolate, desert areas. 7,000 corpses of people have been, have been found in the U.S.-Mexico borderland since the, since the 1990s, for example, due to strict very much connected with the prevention through deterrence strategy. Uh, and then the idea that another layer of, of um, border is a technological layer, which right now the Elbit Systems Towers that I, were, I was just mentioning, and these were these surveillance towers, the Elbit Systems was the, was the technology integrator of the West Bank border, system, border wall system. And they used that, that, what they did there to advertise when, when CBP was looking for doing a request for proposals, Albert Systems said, look, we have 10 plus years doing this in the West Bank. Um, we can bring this to the US-Mexico border. And they got the contract in 2014. And the idea is it's like a virtual wall. They call it the virtual wall. That's an official parlance. Um, and that that's another layer of, of these, these surveillance towers that are working in tandem and their feed into control centers and the drones that are doing overflights, they send feeds to it and they have radar systems, 12,000 implanted motion sensors If people trip a motion sensor, then it beeps in these control centers. These control centers are all throughout the US-Mexico borderlands. So there's another layer, a further layer is checkpoints. So roadside checkpoints that are now really in the center of a region, right, where people, you know, just traveling anywhere, people living in the region from 25 miles to 100 miles inland, you know, you could go through a border patrol checkpoint. The ACLU has called, called it a constitution-free zone. Um, the, the idea that your Fourth Amendment right not to be searched nor seized is very much violated or mangled. <coughs> um, it, there's resistance to it, obviously, but that's what's going on. A lot of people, you know. So that's another layer. And then roving patrols of border patrol, they go as far as where you're seeing the green stripes, um, border patrol vehicles, and their collaborations with police. And there's plenty of collaborations with police from the actual border counties inland to the 100 miles. These, these roving patrols be, become a part of this, like, um, you know, very extended border apparatus that goes inland, but it also goes outward. And as I, when I was first doing my presentation, I discussed how the Mexico-Guatemala border has been built up. And if you look at the Married Initiative, which is a, a, um, this counter-narcotic. Um, initiative between Mexico and the United States. A big part of that is U.S. Fund, funneling of monies 
and technologies and trainings to Mexico, and they've been building up their southern border, particularly since 2014, but even before that. And so when you look at U.S. border strategy again, the extension of the border, uh, you know, this multi-layered aspect of it is also the extending of it to other places. And so there's, there's all these aspects of it, of it coming inland and outward, and then all the stuff that Brandon was talking about as far as the border becoming everywhere, um, you know, it, 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 every, you know, it infuses the country. Um, and so, like, yeah, so, you know, there's, and, and this is all connected to this corporate nexus apparatus that are constantly doing these these massive technology shows. You go into them, it's like seeing almost in a way a crystal ball of what's being imagined for the future. And from, from that point of view, like these, you go into these tech, technology expos and you'll see robots crawling over the place, drones going everywhere, biometrics, facial recognition, cactus, um, cactuses that have been turned into surveillance cameras. You know, you have, you have so much like stuff that you think is total science fiction. And it's actually being imagined, and a lot. You go into these places; they're not all being deployed, but some of it is, and they're definitely being sold, and they're in conversations. And what I would say is a very much an industrial complex that is that is kind of ruling the show. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That brings us to the conclusion of our event, and um, huge thanks to all of you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.